Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue looking at active RC filters by looking at some of the more odd circuits associated with this topic. Things like all pass filters and negative impedance. But also look at some tools you can use to design a filter without bothering too much with the mathematics. So the first thing to look at is the all pass filter. The main characteristic of this type of filter is that the gain or magnitude of the response is fixed, but the phase behavior is frequency dependent. So for this, I found a few implementations where the phase either starts at 180 and goes down to zero, or starts at zero and goes down to minus 180. This is valid for first order filters. And with second order filters, it either starts with the same 180 and zero degrees, but has a full 360 degrees of change. Higher order filters can of course be built by cascading multiple of the initial first or second order ones to get larger phase shifts. Now, the last thing to consider is the group delay associated with this kind of filter. The signals coming out of these filters will have a certain group delay at low frequency, which reduces as frequency increases. Higher and higher order filters will have a more significant associated delay. So the main use case for such a filter is phase compensation, when this is needed, and delay circuitry. As practical implementations, for the first order all pass filter, we have these two circuits. These are designed by first of all choosing a corner frequency, so where the phase shift will be in the middle, either plus or minus 90 degrees, based on the exact implementation, and the exact time delay at low frequency, in both cases should be the same. Now other than the RC network, the other two resistors are used to set the gain of the op amp, and to get the desired effect of flat gain, these two resistors should be set equal. So if we now run the circuit and we observe the output, so it's more or less flat in our first circuit, and with the second circuit, we are getting a bit of variation, so this is about half a decibel, but when we look at the phase response for our first circuit, so the green line, we are getting a very nice transition going from about 180 down to zero, and with the second circuit, the blue response, the variation is going from zero degrees down to minus 180. Both passing through the plus or minus 90 degree point at around 1.59 kilohertz. Now, for the moment, if we just hide our magnitude and plot rather than phase group delay, we will observe that both circuits have more or less the exact same response. So at low frequency, we are getting a group delay of around 200 microseconds. And this decreases as frequency increases. Now, turning to second order filters, there are multiple implementations. And the one that I found is building on the previous two circuits. So it uses the same op amp in a inverting configuration and the RC networks are doubled. So you're getting an extra element in series or parallel with the previous one. And well, based on the exact configuration, you will be getting a different response. Now, the strange thing about this circuit is the exact gain setting. So this will impact the overall Q factor. So to get a relatively flat response, you need to keep a one to five ratio in between the gain setting components. But other than that, the circuit is working as before. So when we run it, if we have a look at the response of the first one, so we are getting a relatively flat amplitude response, so about 0.4 decibels of variation. Similarly for the second one, again 0.4 decibels of variation, but the baseline is minus 14 this time. But if we now hide the magnitude and only focus on the phase, for the first circuit, so the one in green, phase starts at about 0 degrees, goes down to minus 360, and for the second circuit in blue, it starts at plus 180, and goes down to minus 180. Again, the halfway point, so zero or minus 180 degrees, is at 1.59 kilohertz. Finally, if we look at the group delay, we can see that both circuits are giving us more or less the exact same response. So we have about 600 microseconds of group delay, which is much higher than what we obtained with our previous two circuits. So going from first order to second order, we went up from 200 microseconds up to around 600 microseconds. So far, we looked over the main types of filter, the high and low pass, band pass and band stop, and the all pass. But another thing to consider when using active components is the possibility to create new components. 
and by new, I mean create circuits that present certain characteristics that cannot easily, or cannot at all, be constructed with real passive components. So the first circuit to look at is the negative impedance converter. The general circuit is built around a single op amp with three distinct impedances placed around it. And the final input impedance, as seen from the outside terminal, is defined by this formula. So it will be minus times the first and third impedance divided by the second impedance. So based on what each impedance is, either a resistor, inductor or capacitor, the final behavior will be derived based on this formula. Since there is a minus in there, we can get some interesting outcomes. So I tried to prepare a table with the various behaviors that can be obtained based on the properties of the three elements. So with all three elements being resistors, the final result will be a negative resistance. So the behavior of a resistor that presents a 180 degrees of phase shift. Then if we swap one of the elements with either an inductor or capacitor, we get what I guess would be called a negative or backwards component. I could not really find the proper name for it. So in the first case, you will get a frequency dependent variation of the impedance characteristic of a capacitor. So impedance will drop as frequency increases, but the current voltage phase ratio will be inverted to what it should normally be. So from a phase point of view, it will be behaving like an inductor. If we swap the middle impedance with a reactive component, the behavior will be the same, but for the other reactive element. This circuit can be quite confusing. Finally, if we add two reactive elements, say two inductors or two capacitors, you get what is called a frequency dependent resistor. When multiplying these impedances, the imaginary part gets squared, so it becomes minus one, which multiplied with the existing minus becomes a positive. So the final phase value will be zero, but the impedance will still vary with frequency either increase like for an inductor or decrease like for a capacitor. Now, just to confirm these behaviors, let's test this thing out in the simulator. So let's first take the case of the negative impedance resistor implementation. To keep things simple, all resistors in the circuit are equal to one kilo ohm and the resulting impedance should be minus one kilo ohm. Now to observe the impedance, I will be driving the circuit with a current source that has an AC amplitude of one so the impedance of the circuit will be the voltage observed in this node divided by the current value of one. So from a numerical point of view, the impedance will be equal to the voltage in this node. So by using the same method to drive a real one kilo ohm resistor, if we choose logarithmic representation, we are getting a clear line at 1000 and a phase shift of zero degrees. So nothing special. But when we apply the same type of measurement on our negative resistance, well, we get the same value of 1000, but this time the phase shift is minus 180 degrees. So it's inverted to what it should be. Now, to highlight some of the properties of the circuit, I added in a series and a parallel resistor, and while the total resulting resistance can be calculated based on the generic formulas for resistors in series and parallel. But keeping in mind that the resistance of our circuit is negative. So if we run the circuit, when the minus 1000 ohm resistor is in series with the plus 900 ohms, the result is negative 100. And when 900 is in parallel with minus 1000, the result is about 10,000. Moving on, we can look at our frequency dependent resistors. So these circuits are built using two same type reactive elements. So when we run these, we are getting either a falling slope impedance with a phase of about zero, or we are getting a rising impedance with the same zero phase. So one interesting application of this circuit can be observed when we take it and place it in series with a real resistor. So with this arrangement, if we look at the output voltage, so I'm using a voltage source this time, we can build a low pass filter. So the response amplitude drops after a corner frequency, but unlike a regular filter, the circuit does not apply any sort of phase shift. So the phase shift is more or less zero. So in a sense, this is the opposite of the old pass. Amplitude varies, but phase does not. Finally, we can look at the negative capacitor and negative inductor circuits. So here I prepared multiple implementations based on which of the circuit components is changed. So with a real capacitor, impedance is dropping, 
and the phase is at minus 90 degrees, whereas with the negative capacitor circuit, we have the same impedance drop, but a plus 90 degrees of phase shift. Similarly for the inductor, the real inductor and the negative inductor show the same impedance variation, but they have inverted phase values. Now, as an application of this sort of circuit, I paired one of our circuits, so the one that presents a negative 1 millihenry inductance, with a 100 nanofarad real capacitor. So, before looking at the response of this circuit, we can look at the equivalent built with real components, so real inductor and real capacitor, we are getting a very clear resonance frequency, with impedance rising before and falling after, and phase going from plus 90 degrees to minus 90 degrees, and with our active circuit, we are getting a similar impedance profile, it's just that the resonance frequency is at a different point, but the phase no longer changes, so it stays more or less constant at minus 90. Now, while on the subject of strange circuits, you also have the general impedance converter. This is a more advanced circuit, but it does allow a very important possibility. Create one reactive component using the other. Specifically, build large value inductors while using only capacitors. But real inductors, not the negative kind. So this thing is called a general impedance converter. And I will not be going into too many details with this circuit today, but just mention that the input impedance is a product of the five constituent impedances. But this time, in the impedance calculation, there is no minus involved. So, a special case is to mention, when either the second or fourth impedance is a reactive element, so either a capacitor or an inductor, the final behavior will be inverted. This way, you can easily build large value inductors, while only using capacitors and resistors. The other special case to mention is when two of the odd impedances are of the same type, so either two capacitors or two inductors. Here, the imaginary parts will get multiplied, forming a minus, and the resulting behavior will be that of a frequency-dependent negative resistance. So, to highlight the two behaviors, I created a few test circuits. First thing to look at is the active inductor implementation. So with the circuit, we can observe the impedance again using the current source. So we see a rising impedance behavior with a plus 90 degrees of phase shift, which is the same as you would get with a actual inductor. So using this sort of circuit, if we also add a parallel capacitor, we can create a bandpass filter. If we look at the response, we can see the typical response, amplitude increasing and then decreasing, and the phase behavior goes from plus 90 down to minus 90. To highlight the other behavior, I have this circuit in which two of the impedances are capacitors. And well, if we simulate, the final behavior is a variable impedance, but with a phase shift of 180 degrees. So this is kept up till the point where the op amps limitations start to kick in. So if we now take this circuit and place it in series with a real resistor, and we look at the total impedance, we can see that up until a point, the real resistor is predominant, so at an impedance of 1000, we are getting a phase shift of zero, then at a certain frequency, the two impedances become equal, so they cancel each other out, and after that, the negative impedance becomes predominant, so it is showing us a minus 180 degrees of phase shift. The last thing to touch upon is how to design a specific filter for your needs. Now, if you just want a basic first or second order filter, the math is quite basic. Most of the formulas I highlighted are good enough to get you started. But once you wish to design a higher order filter with a specific response type, things get a bit complicated. You do have various books on the topic, mostly focusing on the mathematics and providing tables of coefficients, but that's just a lot of work. There must be an easier way. So, on a quick online search, you will be able to find multiple online calculators, but there is one that I want to highlight today, the Analog Devices Analog Filter Wizard. I haven't really used this in the past, but I did like the level of detail to which the calculator goes. So, this tool can calculate active, low-pass, high-pass, and band-pass filters, so to exemplify its capabilities, I'll just select one. So, the first interesting thing about this tool is its approach. It starts you off by requesting some general design parameters. 
like what is the exact pass band, what is the desired gain and frequency, as well as stop band related parameters. And then it requires the desired type of response. So do you want to filter with fewer stages that has a certain ripple, like a Chebyshev, or do you want a filter with a smoother response, but with more stages? So by playing around with the slider, you can always check the response in the associated graph. Based on the various chosen settings, you can observe the response in multiple expression methods. So you can either look at magnitude in decibels or in volts. You can observe the phase response, group delay, as well as the step response. So when the filter is used with pulses rather than continuous signals, there will be a specific response characteristic. Also, one of the things that you can observe is the various stages needed to build this filter. So what will be the specific order, gain, corner frequency, and Q factor. So once you're happy with the response type and the various characteristics, you can move on to the next step to actually start choosing real components. So the nice thing about this tool is that it does not consider just the resistors and capacitors. It also takes into account the op amps limitations. So for example, if we quickly switch to a high pass type of filter that would have this sort of ideal response, when we go to implement it with actual components, this program will also show you the high frequency limitations that you can run into. So the program simulates up to three decades above the corner frequency and based on your specific application, you may or may not care about the response at such a high frequency. So if this circuit would be used in an audio application, you don't really care about a few dozen kilohertz. But if your application is different, then this sort of low pass limitation at high frequencies would not be acceptable. So then for the component selection, you can either use the recommended parts or you can choose some yourself. You can play around with the resistor capacitor networks. So either go for lower or smaller value resistors and capacitors. And you can also choose different op amps from the available analog library. So for example, if we select this op amp with everything left the same, when we go back to the magnitude response, we can see a much nicer high frequency behavior. Anyway, coming back to the passive components, at this step at least, we are using some ideal component values. So based on the calculations, we are getting various components which may or may not be realistic. So in our next step, we can start choosing some realistic components. So select the preferred series for the various components as well as their specific tolerances. So this is important to take into account since the filter may not have the exact expected behavior. If we look again to the magnitude response, we will observe that the tool is calculating our typical response as well as our extreme responses based on our component characteristics. So for example, with these chosen values, we can see that even though we're not supposed to have any gain peaks, we can have them in certain cases based on what real components we actually end up having. So even though this may not be intended, in a real life circuit, you may still get some non-desired effects. Other than this, we also get various other useful information like input impedance, noise, power, and various other things. And at the final step, you can download various files related to the circuit that you've just designed, order samples, and so on. So this is quite a complete tool for the types of filter that are being supported. Now, active and passive RC filters are mostly used at relatively low frequency and only when processing signals. Very rarely are they used in power circuits. These types of filters have the main downsides of large loss from all the resistance or needing an active amplification element, which needs extra power. If only there were some components that are not so lossy, something reactive only. Well, that's a topic for next time. For now, hope you enjoyed this video. And if so, there are more videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest videos, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.